People in the audience, how many people here were trained as artists, architects, designers, some kind of creative work? Could you stand up? Stand up. I lost your question. These, these are all people who were trained professionally as artists or, or, or cultural workers, critics, art historians. You can join them. Okay. All right. It's good size. Good, good number of people. All right. Good. Gives us a chance to stretch a little too, right? Um, I want to complicate things a little bit and maybe begin by talking a little bit about my own history because I, I'm also an artist. I trained as an artist. I studied with Hans Hacke, who has some terrific work in the exhibition, by the way, which I recommend. He's got a, a visitor's poll that he updated. He did the original one in the 70s, and he's got a new one now that's worth trying out. It's digital in this, in this case. Um, so I studied, I studied in the late 70s, early 80s with, with him, and then I graduated uh, art school and started working with various artist collectives, first with political art documentation distribution, which was a group that tried to create an archive about political art. And the banner that we had in our offices was pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will from Antonio Gramsci. Um, and we were very influenced by this more Gramscian idea of a kind of hegemonic uh, version of what might be possible to kind of push back against capital. And we were distancing ourselves, let's say, from a more classical economist version of, of kind of Marxism, right, based in superstructure. And then I got involved in another group. You'd think I'd had enough of collectives at that point, but sometime in the late 80s, I got involved in a group called Repo History, where we tried to put markers up in the street to talk about histories that had been forgotten in New York City including where the first slave market was, which was on Wall Street, or where the stock exchange had gotten its start, and, and other, other, all kinds of histories we did, where the, where the first shoreline was, which was filled in by Europeans uh, after the Native Americans had been pushed out. So these collectives were very engaging. They had different structures, which we could talk about another time, because they also offer some alternatives. But one of the things that occurred to me was there, there, none of this appeared in any of the art history books that I was reading. There was, there was no critical feedback. There was very little uh, historical uh, work done, being done on these, uh, on these groups. Uh, maybe the exception being Lucy Lepard, and there's just a few smattering of a few books. And so that occurred to me, where did they go? What happens to this? Where, where does it come from? And one of the things I began to do is look into what the absence of collective practices was about within the context of art, right? Uh, does it simply rest outside of what we consider to be the valuable objects that artists create, the kind of things that we see mostly in the biennial? Or is it something that's really integral to the production of art? And it, and it became pretty clear that the kind of art we're talking about, contemporary art, would never be possible without many, many, many people contributing their social labor to its production. It's integral to it. And yet, where do they appear? Where are they? How many people in the United States, for example, were getting Masters of Fine Arts degrees, which the, the, these programs were exploding and are still exploding and reproducing themselves over and over again, and yet when you look around, you pick up an art magazine, there's a limited number of people that are being represented. Where do all these people go? And that began to sort of make me think about, okay, they are not simply outside of the production of art, they're integral to the production of art, even though they're invisible as Noah was pointing out. So what does it mean? They're an invisible force that's holding up a structure and reproducing that structure, right? That's the important part. Myself, I was reproducing this structure called art, and yet we remain large, by and large, on the outside of it. So I started to think about, well, what did that consist of? One was certainly the large majority of professionals who are trained by the system, and yet in the end, who never gain any real purchase or visibility within it. That's a lot of people, particularly in the United States. And remember, in the United States, we don't have, as several people have pointed out, uh, and Noah in particular, we don't have the, the sort of substantial government funding that we used to have when we were still involved in a Cold War with a certain other system, and we needed to have funding. It wasn't just the, it wasn't just the, uh, the culture wars that ended the funding in the United States, it was the end of the Cold War. We no longer had a logic or a reason to support high culture because there was no ideological function for it. That was a big part of what ended. Because if you look 
where the NEA stops, it stops right around the time that the Berlin Wall comes down, right? So sometime between Sputnik, which was when I was practically born, and then you had this kind of momentum to fund things. It's all privatized now in the United States. And so that means you do have to become an individual entrepreneur. And I teach students, I'm an art instructor at the City University in New York City, and I have to teach them to some degree. Well, how do you go out there and market yourself? So it's not even like invisibly, it's overtly we have to sort of begin to do this, otherwise they just, they just become completely sort of marginalized. But what do they do? They often end up maybe building other people's artworks, installing their artworks, running their galleries, uh, becoming administrators, and so on and so forth. So they find niches within the system, but by and large they're paying out of their own pocket to be artists. They're going into debt to be artists. So it's not just student debt we're talking about, it's the amount of money you have to pay to be an artist that also contributes to the, to the system which reproduces itself and yet completely marginalizes the majority. The point that I try to make with this theory and this book called Dark Matter, which was published now about four years ago, five years ago, really finished five years ago, before Occupy took place, was that like astronomical dark matter, which scientists, cosmologists believe is 95, 96% of the universe, except nobody knows what it is. It's a non-reflective substance. It, 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 everyone's desperate in the scientific community to find out what it is, because it obviously keeps the universe from completely expanding and becoming just a cold, flat, empty, emptiness. Right? It's the gravity of that dark matter that's holding the universe together. Precisely the same metaphor, a little bit of a science fiction metaphor, fits in with the program here, to talk about the majority of artists and cultural producers who are keeping intact this universe and yet they themselves are invisible or the non-reflective material within it. But unlike the scientific world, most of the people who manage the art world aren't looking for the dark matter. In fact, they would rather not see it. What's changed dramatically is the dark matter is beginning to become brighter. It's brightening itself. Thanks to a number of things, one of them is the precariousness and flexibility of labor that the system depends upon, pulling from all these resources, mining all the data it can, all of us, that means there's a dependency. And the second thing is, of course, the technology that's used to communicate vis-a-vis -vis neoliberalism, we can take advantage of that and self-represent, and that's happening again and again. Now, after I published the book and I said dark matter is rising up, this, this invisible archive, this shadow archive, which is full of dead capital, if you will, in a certain way, is coming together like a kind of a zombie army, I started to realize that actually that zombie army isn't all great, right? Not all dark matter is a good thing. And having been uh, just last April on Maidan in Ukraine, where the forces, there were many good progressive forces, but there were many more not so good progressive forces, and this is going on in a lot of different ways in the United States with the Tea Party, you realize that this growing visibility of what sustains the system but was marginalized is not all a positive thing. And what we are trying to do in Gulf Labor, which I'm also a part of, et cetera, and other organizations, I think, is in a sense to identify with the most progressive aspects of this, uh, this sort of uh, invisible, let's say, structure of this invisible archive and, and strengthen it, right, at this particular moment. That's crucial. I'm just going to say one other real quick thing, and um, Andrew Ross mentioned in the beginning, and we, we thank you guys for bringing us here, Sally Docs, but it, it's actually worth mentioning that we also did get support from the biennial and from Oakley and Wesser, who, who curated this biennial, and I think it's Interesting that he would put himself out there to actually invite someone, a group like Gulf Labor, to do something. And I know he's already gotten considerable criticism from the high art establishment for doing that. Which is only to say that these things are complicated and they're contradictions that are involved in what we're doing. And we can't simply present, pretend that we're completely outside of the system. It's exactly the point that I'm making. This dark matter is not outside the system. It's absolutely at the very center of it. It's a kind of presence, absence within the very heart of what the art world is. So the question is now, how do we sort of embrace this ultra re redundancy that the forces of dark matter art productivity are? One way to do that is to recognize the potential it has for political change. And how do we begin to identify and create a different kind of block, not a block 
like this, but a kind of Gramscian block between the bottom and the top, so that the people who are building the installations for artists over here in the biennial and the people who are at the top of the chain begin to find a way to have solidarity, political solidarity, top to bottom. It's the only way that we're going to be able to transform a kind of culture, neoliberal culture, into a kind of political culture again, right? or political cultural force. So that's my quick sketch. Thank you.